There's a story of a man who uh, was very uh, intoxicated, and he was sort of known around town for this, and he had a habit of sort of stumbling around town when he was in such a state. And this one day, he happened to wander into uh, his local Catholic church, and uh, seeking a place to, uh, to rest uh, himself, he uh, entered a confessional booth, and, uh, and he sits down in this booth, and uh, it keeps quiet. And uh, he might even appear uh, to be unconscious. And uh, the priest, who is uh, in the adjacent booth, ready to take his confession, starts to get a little bit irritated with the man. So he coughs three times to try to get his attention. But the drunk, again, just kind of sits there and doesn't say anything. Well, finally, the priest had enough. And so he just banged on the side of that booth three times. To which the drunk finally responded and said, Ain't no use knocking. There's no paper on this side either. <laughs> For some, these things that we do in church, whether we be Roman Catholics with a professional booth or even Anglicans here with all our, the things that we do, um, can, can, can seem to be kind of confusing and we don't always know what they're about and what they're for. But really, we are very intentional in our space and ornamenting our space with rich symbols and imagery and ways in which we explore the meaning of our faith together. And let's highlight a couple of those things this morning. Uh, The first, of course, is the symbol that we um, uh, particularly emphasized last Sunday with the baptisms that we had. And as you came into church this morning, uh, you would have passed by our baptismal font on the way into the church. And this is really a a rich symbol that we have to recognize the new life that we have in Christ. And we place the font at the back of the church to emphasize the person's baptized life, that as they're baptized into Christ's life, uh, we have uh, new access to God's presence in a a special way. We are identifying ourselves as children of God, and uh, and it's really uh, a wonderful reminder of that each time we come into worship. Other things we do with our space, of course, we see all the stained glass windows. St. Matthew's is blessed to have many beautiful windows uh, here and uh, that really tell the story of our faith. And as the light shines from the outside in, uh, representing how God's, the light of God's presence can bring uh, uh, life and light and truth to us through God's word as they are de- scenes of sacred scripture are depicted in these, uh, in these paintings and the, and the ascension of Christ. Uh, the, the large window on the way out reminds us that we are going with Christ and the Christ as he departed the earth promised his Holy Spirit to be with us always and at all times. Wonderful uh, symbols of the faith. And this morning, as I already shared with the children today, we also recognize, of course, this great symbol that we have, the symbol of the cross. Now today we celebrate, we call it Holy Cross Day. Why Today, of all days. I'm glad you asked. I know you're all thinking that in your minds. Uh, According to ancient uh, legends and church tradition, uh, the true cross, that is the very cross that Christ was crucified on, was discovered in the year 326 by St. Helena, who was the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. She discovered the cross while she was making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So then this church, as was often done when sacred uh, items were found, uh, traditionally, they would build a church. So they built a church called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, built on that site. And nine years later, uh, it was dedicated. And it was dedicated, that church was dedicated really over two days, and uh, on September 13th and September 14th. And on the second day was when the cross was actually brought inside the church, and all who wished could come and could venerate the cross and, uh, and pray to God. Now, I like sort of recognizing some of these ancient traditions and customs um, because I find them comforting. I find them meaningful. And I do benefit and really enjoy um, the beneficiaries of modern uh, technology. Uh, you know, I'm preaching from a tablet this morning, working on using technology as part of our worship. I think that's important. The creative arts are important, newness in the arts and uh, academic breakthroughs. There's something really important about that newness. But there's also something special about the tradition, especially a traditional symbol like the cross that roots us in Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. Now, there are many in our culture, and in fact, many identifying themselves as Christians that would like to veer away from these kinds of symbols and the teaching that goes with them. Not to pick on this fellow, because he gets picked on a lot, but I will mention, uh, some of you probably know Joel Olstein, of course. Millions of people watch him, and he was just at the Air Canada Centre the other week. 
and members of my extended family went to go see him. And uh, he's a bit of a polarizing figure because a lot of people really appreciate his positive, um, upbeat messages, and he talks about how he thinks a lot of times people uh, don't need help uh, to know that they, are, that they are sinners, that they're always being, um, uh, being negative about themselves, and so he tries to present sort of a positive message. But critics of Osteen point out that uh, even in his own church, uh, there, you can't find a cross anywhere uh, hanging, or, or the image of the cross anywhere in his church. And it's sort of representative of a lot of his teaching that veers away from talking about the cross, that talks about the death of Christ, that talks about sin and these kinds of issues. And really, he'd prefer to focus on uh, sort of self-help type teaching. Now, I think there's probably merits uh, to both cases, but I think it's important today, and I found it interesting that today, that we celebrate Holy Cross Day just on the eve of this fellow's visit. Because today we are reminded through the readings, and through St. Paul particularly, that he talks about the importance of of a mess, the message of Jesus Christ. And he calls the message the power of God. The power of God. And he says that message is the message of the cross. Now the ancient Greeks had a word for message. It was kerygma. The New Testament scholars talk about the kerygma of the New Testament. What is the basic simple message of the New Testament? And they say it is that Christ, first of all, was the Messiah, that he had been prophesied about in the Old Testament, that he came to the earth, that he was crucified, that he died on the cross, that he rose gloriously from the dead, that he appeared, and he appeared to the disciples, that there were witnesses of these things. And now he has ascended and is at the right hand of the Father. This is the simple distillation of the gospel message or the kerygma. In John's gospel we heard this morning, we hear a little bit of a way of sort of unpacking that message or of applying that message and John employs some images and allusions to help us understand the meaning and significance of these things. And I want to talk about three sort of images or ways of thinking about the message of the cross that the gospel writer John gives us today. Firstly, he cites an allusion to an Old Testament story and likens Jesus almost to a ladder. I'll get to that in a second. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay. No one has ascended into heaven except the Son who has descended. So there's ascending and descending. Well, what's he getting at there? This is actually an allusion to an Old Testament story of Jacob. Everyone remember Jacob's vision? Jacob, and he had the vision of Jacob's ladder. We've heard probably that phrase before. And in that story, Jacob has this vision of angels ascending and descending from this, this giant ladder between heaven and earth. And there was a sense that God's presence, mediated particularly through the angels, or represented through the angels, uh, was coming and going between heaven and earth, that there was an interplay between heaven and earth. Well, John is talking about Christ in this way. Christ as a type of ladder almost, one who descended from heaven, who's ascending to the Father, but as the Son of God and as God's very own self, he becomes the way, the truth, and the life the method of delivering God's word and grace to the world. And the image of Christ on the cross, if we can sort of picture it or envision it as we may even kind of drift to picturing the cross above me, as you might see it, we can almost see that truth sort of revealed in this image of the cross that's up high, you know, raised at a higher level. And there's a sense of being ascending as the cross is lifted high and as Christ was lifted high on the cross. But the cross is also rooted on the ground, on the earth. And so we can almost kind of see this cross as a kind of a bridge or a kind of a ladder. And in Christ's person, we see the wedding of divinity and humanity coming together to restore and heal the world. The message of the cross is one that says that, that God in Christ then speaks through, through, speaks through Christ's life and ministry. We come to identify that when Christ speaks, it is God speaking. When Christ heals, it is God healing. When Christ raises the dignity of women, embraces a sinner, God is healing, embracing, restoring. And he does so by means of his cross. Secondly, we also see Christ as the means to life. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Seems like kind of an obscure reference, the serpent in the wilderness. Well, if you don't know the story, 
the stories of the people of God, the people of Israel, when they were freed from slavery in Egypt, God led them out into the promised land. And of course, was, was, was their custom and human custom and human habit is they would often forget about God and grumble and complain about their circumstance and they would sin and turn away from God and God would have to remind them of this sin. And so the snakes had been, God had sent snakes amongst their camp that was biting and poisoning the people and the people realizing that they were, uh, that they're being humbled here were crying out to God, God save us, forgive us, we're sorry. So God told Moses to build, uh, to craft a, a serpent out of bronze and to put it on a pole and to lift the pole high and when the people would look upon it, they would be healed. John is helping the people to remember their history. Remember, John's audience would have grown up with these stories and helping them to see that just as they, just as the people of old, as their ancestors of old were in bondage of slavery, so they were in bondage to their sin. And just as God delivered the people of Israel, God was delivering them and bringing them into new life. And when they turn away from God, God calls them back to, by his divine voice. When they are sick and afflicted, God provides a means by which they may be saved. And the man on the cross, like the serpent on the pole, is a way God provided healing for his people. It is in fact the way, as John later talks about, the definitive act of salvation. It is God's dealing with the disease of sin once and for all, a divine remedy that all are invited to receive. Lastly, we have some of the most well-beloved verses in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Love, not condemnation, is this message. Salvation, reprieve from judgment. These verses are some of the most dearly beloved words of Scripture. Probably the most famous ones we have. And verses we read in the common prayer liturgy before Eucharist, we call them comfortable words. They're words that comfort our soul. That show us and reveal to us God's great love for us. In the context of Holy Cross Day, we might picture Christ on the cross and see that his arms are outstretched, are outstretched in a type of embrace, wishing to embrace the whole world, longing to love and heal and restore God's beloved creation. His battered body, a loving sacrifice made to restore a shattered relationship. So this morning, as we reflect on this image of the cross, what do you see when you gaze upon the cross? Do you find in it your salvation, acceptance, and healing? Can you picture Christ on the cross, arms outstretched, embracing you in your weakness? Can you find love and acceptance in that embrace? And what's more, do you embrace Christ back in the way that God embraces you? If you've ever hugged someone and them not hugged you back, how that feels. Do we hug God back? Do we respond to his grace and his mercy and his salvation? Do we find in the cross that comfort that we are so cherished by God that God was willing to die for us? As we move forward as a church, discerning God's leading and barking and exciting new ministries with a renewed sense of purpose to impact our community, we must never forget that core message, the kerygma of our faith. Fundamentally, we are people of the cross. May we never be ashamed of it, but embrace it as Christ embraces us. For the message of the cross is to us who are being saved, the very power of God. Amen.